So I wanted to thank the organization and, and so on. Uh, it's nice to have the conference again. Um, and today I want to talk to you about uh, memory tuning. Um, so in the last, I'll say, couple of years or three years, uh, there have been many uh, different patches, uh, patch set about memory tuning. Um, kind of, uh, you know, if, I've, if you haven't done one, I'm not a cool kid, I guess. Um, I'm not a cool kid, I haven't done one. Uh, but I think like there's a lot of different uh, ID and different direction is going in. And I wanted to try to uh, take advantages of Linux members to have like maybe a discussion about, um, you know, what can we do, what kind of synergy we can have. Um, because I've seen a bunch of slightly different approaches. So I'm not gonna over all the slide I have because uh, really I think the background is pretty, um, is pretty obvious. I'm gonna flash most of the slide I have pretty quickly. Um, unless some people raise a hand or ask me to slow down. Uh, but, you know, I want to focus on the discussion more than actually uh, focus on presenting something. So the first thing I wanted to, to, to share with people really is that we have a pyramid of, of, of memory. Uh, and I see like three different things. Uh, people look at latency, bandwidth, and capacity. And usually they don't go uh, any and you know, like you have a very high bandwidth, low latency, that's what you're looking for. But usually they have a, a low uh, low capacity. Uh, so that's why you see like this pyramid going uh, in kind of a multiple direction. Um, and so, yeah, you know, we have producer, cache, HBM, local CPU, remote CPU, and now we have CXL memory and, uh, and we can have even more memory technology on the horizon. Um, you know, I'm just not going to go over too quickly, like capacity growth factors and memory performance, the physics, the capacity, and so on. Um, the memory is becoming a large chunk of the TCO. Uh, the capacity and bandwidth is kind of an issue because the CPU core count is actually uh, keep growing faster than actually the memory bandwidth. If you look at the bandwidth per CPU core, you will see this kind of stagnating. Uh, it's barely improving over years. Um, and the capacity per core is improved, but uh, slower than the needs apparently. Like uh, we are told that many workloads are wanting more and more memory. Um, and at the same time, there is a physics limit. The density of memory, you know, is coming to an end um, because of the processing and so on. Uh, so we won't see much more improvement inside density. So, you know, we kind of going from this world where you just have the cache and the memory on, on your CPU to a world where you have like multiple hierarchy of memory uh, from the cache, the HBM. HBM is like a local fast memory connected on the same time or with die interposer. So very fast um, and you can have multiple tier, like I'm just showing two tier memory and so on. So anyways, it's, uh, I'm assuming it's very obvious to most of the people here in the room. Um, obviously, we want to keep the temp performance really, uh, you know, we want all data to be in the fastest memory and so on. Um, there is two things here I kind of want to point out. You know, you can try to achieve all this through hardware, but that's what the cache is doing really for, for a long time. Uh, but I believe there's a limit to what you can do in hardware. Uh, there's a limit to what you can do with the cache. And I think it's been, you know, uh, um, um, an area where like a CPU manufacturer have been always struggling with cache and multiple cache levels and so on. Uh, there is, I think, uh, a limit where you can scale you know, cache size versus power point and so on. So I believe we're going to need software for that. Um, one thing I want to point out to remind people is that an application cannot access all its data at all time. You know, it's only going to be able to access a subset of its data sets for most applications. Some applications are like, you know, uh, odd duck somewhere over there that uh, can access all its data because there is a very small data set, but it's not the kind of application we're worrying here about. Um, and so there's like two other things I want to point out, explicit versus, versus implicit. So explicit placement is what an application is deciding by itself where it wants to place its memory, uh, which kind of uh, uh, physical memory you want to use, and the implicit placement is well, somebody else, whether the kernel, some kind of daemon, somebody else is trying to place uh, memory on the behalf of the thing. So if you think about it, it's all like NUMA, all again, you know, asymmetric bandwidth and latency. Um, it's very much what we've been uh, seeing with NUMA. Um, and NUMA can, can have different flavor, you know, when you only have two socket, it's kind of easy, very symmetrical. But when you start having more than two socket, four socket, or even more, uh, then, you know, you don't necessarily have, have multiple paths um, across all the, all the sockets, so you can have a, a, a more asymmetric and more complex topology. Well, why, why does multiple paths make any difference to latency? So, um, like in the example I'm giving, like it's all the same latency, but if you have like a more complex topology, you can... Whoa.
Please stand by, we're experiencing minor technical difficulties. <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah, so you can have two paths with different latency. Um, that's, I don't think that that's very, I don't think there's any, uh, um, anybody doing that today. Um, I, uh, is that something that's gonna happen with CXL? Um, most likely, uh, in some of the topology I've seen. Um, so, you know, brace for you. <laughs> brace yourself, I guess. Um, what I wanted to point out with Numa really is that uh, the uh, lesson we, 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 have, we can take from Numa is that um, only a small subset of application actually uh, are Numa aware. A very few application took the, uh, um, you know, uh, the artwork of uh, actually trying to uh, leverage uh, Numa, um, which is um, most often a large application. Uh, some application leverage Numa through the library, you know, memory allocation library and so on. Um, you know, and also obviously you have mechanism like autonoma uh, kernel stuff. Um, so, you know, for memory tuning, the definition I want, I think everybody that has been looking into memory tuning is like using gold pages. A page has not been accessed um, in the last n millisecond. Usually it's like a minute or so. Um, and no page is not accessed more than some number of time over the same kind of period. Um, and that you have this kind of two, two thing. Um, and so like you have this, um, continuous flow of pages, you know, cold pages go from fast to your memory to slower memory and odd pages uh, go via other direction, um, you know, a, a perpetual movement. Um, and one of the big questions is how do you measure success really? How you do know that you're taking the best decision? Um, and the metrics people have been using is really the percentage of memory access that use the fast memory. So if uh, your application is using 100% of its memory access going to the fast memory, then you should assume that uh, there is no regression from a performance point of view. But if your application wants to start using the slower memory, 50% uh, of your memory access is now going to the slower memory, then there is a large chance that you actually your application is going slower than uh, it could go. Um, but it's also not a silver bullet. Some application have um, uh, a background task that is actually dominating the memory access. But what is um, most important to the application is a very low latency. Um, which do a bare, bare minimum access. So, you know, it's like a very corner case either. So, um, so the, the four kind of component I want to talk, and that's really where I wanted to spend most of the time, is um, um, around uh, the, the, the component to use. So cold pages, uh, odd page detection, and page migration and policy and management. Um, so, that's going to be the discussion part. So for the cold page detection, uh, I think the most obvious one is really uh, the least recently used kind of. Um, so that's the first you can use, uh, the first kind of thing you can use from the kernel. If a page has not been used, um, you know, is, is at the bottom of the LRU, uh, it's much likely that this page is a good candidate to actually be migrated instead of, you know, instead of being reclaimed. Uh, like if it's a swap page or going back to disk or, you know, some, some other kind of reclaim swap. Uh, you can migrate it to a slower memory, um, cheaper memory. Um, so I think that's the first kind of candidates. There's Patchet about that. I think it's Meta that has a Patchet for that. I think it's a good mechanism from the kernel. So I don't know if people have any. Seems like an application where just an access bit is not really sufficient because it doesn't tell us anything about the rate of accesses to a given page just frequent, like frequency of since last, last, last access, since the bit was cleared. Uh, has there been any, any look at hardware performance counters or possibly start talking to the hardware people about getting more useful performance counters for this? 
Thank you. A uh, person from a hardware company here. Uh, <laughs> yes, there's been a lot of look into that. Um, there's nothing in hardware yet. If people want hardware counters to help you with this stuff, please ask the hardware companies. Those of us that work for hardware companies, we ask for this stuff all the time and people don't care because we don't write big checks for large numbers of CPUs. So if you guys are writing big checks for CPUs, tell the CPU companies you want this stuff. It'll make it happen faster. <laughs> just, just to follow up on the access bits, you're right that you can only, from one read, you only get the was it touched at all. But people have been looking at statistical stuff where you keep checking and build up some stats over time and get a better idea. Sometimes hardware assisted. Uh, yeah, there's another hardware company here. <laughs> uh, it, it's funny you bring up the access bit thing because we were just looking at, at some access, access counters. Uh, that, that we have on GPUs, and those were batched up in ways that I've always hated, you know, because it's not one access bit per page, it's one access bit, where you get a certain number of access bits, not, not very many, like 4,000 to cover your whole GPU memory space. So I've always been vaguely dissatisfied with that. But um, we started looking at it as a way to say, well, can, you know, are these any good at all? And people started measuring and, uh, as a way to augment your other measurement techniques, uh, we got measurable improvements. Um, like you're saying, Dave, it's it's hard to really build up enough um, of an argument to win over all the other things that the hardware might be doing with its area and its you know its silicon. There's a lot of other stuff that you could be doing. You could be scattering little bits of SRAM throughout your chip, or you could be making magical AI things. It's, it's infinite. And access bits, um, it's, it's hard to make a case. We, we have made a case, so we have some, but we, I don't see us. I'd be happy with just getting one access bit per page, for heaven's sakes. I, I'm getting counters is unimaginable at this point. So just kind of a little snapshot from, from one hardware company. I want to point out one thing is like for cold pages, access bit is good enough because for cold pages, we're looking at a page that has not been accessed for a long time. So, you know, if the access bit is clear, we clear it, we look at it, at it next next minute. And if nobody has said it again for one minute, we know the page is cold. So for cold pages, it's really nice. But for old pages, it's kind of a different topic. And that's where we want the other people to help us because, um, and I think I have a, so, you know, like, if we talk about odd pages detection, it's like that's where we want hardware. I think. I, I, you have... <laughs> okay, so, so like let's maybe switch to odd pages, and I will go back to our cold pages too. So for for odd pages, um, that's where the biggest issue is because for uh, odd pages, you know, yeah, uh, the idea is that uh, you have access frequencies that is going up. So if you're trying to sample with software, it means the CPU overhead of your sampling is going to be higher because you need to sample frequently. Um, but that's not something you want to do. You don't want to spend too much on your CPU cycle, your precious CPU cycle, um, to just sampling the memory access of your other process. You know, it's like a, um, <laughs> monitoring your process and spending most of your time monitoring your process instead of actually letting your process doing some work. Um, so that's where really I think we want to have um, kind of hardware uh, to help us. But the one of the issue, and I think John was like pointing out, is like you know you have four thousand counter, um, and if at the if at the time you have like 4,000 cold pages and then suddenly you have like 8,000 cold pages that are coming out, you're gonna miss half of them. Um, so how do you deal with that? Because yeah, it's, it's kind of a hard problem, so. But I mean, so are you, let me think is, uh, caching kind of defeats this, right? Because if, you, if, you, if, you're if you've got a really hot cache line, you're not going to be bumping the counter on the page while you're just accessing this, you know, page cache lines in L1. So would you want the, the, uh, the, the access bit, the access counter to be incremented when the cache line moves from L, L2 to L1? I mean, you know, you've, you've got three instructions in the sequence which all reference this page. Is that three accesses or is that, well, this is one burst. It, it's really hard to know exactly what it is you want. I, I, I can't even think of what, what, whether that should count as one or as three accesses. You just have to make a decision about it, right? So, I mean, you can say things in the cache is, what are you trying to measure here? Are you trying to measure like how, how much the media matters in your transaction? And that's what we came up with in, in one way was to say, hey, if it's hitting the caches, we don't care about this counting stuff because the caches are helping us out here. So we're gonna concentrate on something like at the memory controller level and say, hey, how much is this hitting the data in the memory controller? So that's one way to look at it. 
you could say, hey, the caches do matter, um, but you know, you come up with a different answer in a different hardware design. Something, something that I've been wanting lately in a different context is some way of estimating how expensive a given memory access is. Because it, that can vary wildly. Is it contended? Is it, uh, I mean, is it in cache? That's really, really hard. It, and because it changes, right? And it changes so much depending on where the memory is, if it's cached and all that stuff. So I don't know. I, th I think that's a really, really hard problem. It's even harder than saying how much is this byte out on this memory controller that access? It'd be great to have, it's just very, very hard to come up with. I'm sorry, uh, somebody raised hand in the remote session, so can you speak up, Bharata? Yeah, yes, this is Bharata here. So on the topic of uh, uh, having hardware assistance uh, to detect the hot pages, uh, okay. there are things like uh, instruction-based samplings that recent uh, AMD processors uh, have well, come up with. Is that, uh, there have been a few attempts to add things to some of the descriptive standards, and the pushback from that side is prove you need it. And at the moment, no one has, so they're not interested. Yeah, and one way to prove that you need it is to like simulate this stuff, right? It is, it's quite possible to build something that pretends to be a piece of hardware and does it by scanning page table access bits. Because we have this data, right, in the hash text bits, but it takes a lot of time to go and churn through them and figure it out. So. That kind of thing exists. I mean, there's a prototype inside of Intel that does something like that. Um, just try and prove that we need it. Um, but, uh, you know, help us make the case. We'd love to have more data, so. I'll tell you where it's come up for me, uh, if it all right a bit. Uh, I did a lazy per CPU counters recently, and there we want to switch adaptively to per CPU counters if the update rate is high enough. That's how we do it now, because if it's updated infrequently, if that cache line is not going to be contended, then an atomic counter is going to be cheaper because it's saving you a pointer fetch. When it becomes contended, we want to switch to per CPU counters. And I'm doing it with just a counter and we, we check the la how often that counter is getting incremented. But, I mean, so that works, but if you come up with something better, and that's, I've seen other places in the kernel where we could be doing these adaptive algorithms if we had a good way of getting the data. I just want to add a, a, a couple of notes to the, the, the thing here. Um, one of them is that auto, auto NUMA is incredibly harmful for at least one use case. And that's where if you've got a CPU and some other device, maybe, you know, GPU, <laughs> And uh, an auto NUMA just goes through and it, it unmaps things, but it's unaware of the other devices. And so then you take unnecessary page faults on, on the other devices. Um, so we've seen that this from a performance point of view for running compute programs, I want to toss that in because I saw that listed as something that, oh, we can use auto NUMA to figure things out. And I'm here to tell you that one of my missions over the next few years is to, be, is to, to make sure that we can turn auto NUMA off um, at, either automatically or, or whatever. Um, I just wanna dump that on you. Um, and, and the other one I wanna mention is that the latency and bandwidth, uh, not, not even mentioning capacity, but if you look in HMAT, which is that ACPI table to describe memory, it has latency and bandwidth and you can list them. And so we had this internal conversation about, oh, that's nice, Let's what, what do we put in there? And and sure, we put in we can put in some numbers, and then, well, what is the kernel going to do? Well, well, nobody knows yet. And oh, how do they compare them? Well, you know, we don't, we don't even know which one the kernel is going to use, or is it going to use both? It's going to multiply them together and figure out some other thing. So all this is an unknown area, and I'm antsy about it being done right. So I just wanted to. Yeah, and one thing also you've described in this talk is you've talked about things being slower or faster, like that's a one-dimensional thing, and like you mentioned, read bandwidth and latency are problems here. So we have. We have memory types that are both higher bandwidth and worse latency. So there's some really nasty complications to all this, just to throw one more thing in there. We, we, we have a bit of an AV issue. I'm just going to uh, relay Barras's question. Uh, rec recent AMD, or comment perhaps, uh, recent AMD processors of IBS instruction-based sampling that could provide information about page accesses, which page got access from cache or DRAM or remote, remote link DRAM, et cetera. Could we explore using these with new balancing to detect and migrate hot pages from lower tiers? And then he notes uh, that it is sampling based. So I think the short answer there is absolutely yes. The same kinds of counters exist on other vendor CPUs as well. Um, 
we've done some, so Huang Ying, who, who is doing some of the autonomia based memory migration stuff, did some experiments um, and some other folks as well to try and figure out, to try and consume those things in order to do memory jerry. Um, they work functionally, it, it, it's actually just fine. Um, the, the trick though that we had was building useful data out of those performance counters um, because they, they vary a whole bunch based on um, some nasty things, but essentially they're really bad for virtualization because of the addresses you get out of them. Um, and it's really hard to turn that just fire hose of data that comes out of the performance counters into like useful, actionable information that would be using that. So while we would all love to be able to um, automatically put the memory in the right place, I mean, fundamentally, it's a hard problem. And how much have we explored and how much have we, uh, how far have we gone into enabling applications to tell us? what they intend to do with a given piece of memory. For example, if I'm going to stream something, I don't care if it's far away, as long as it has a good bandwidth and, uh, and it's pipelined. So uh, how, f how much are we thinking or working on trying to define some form of standard, standard way through MAdvise and whatnot to provide that information that will allow the current to make better decisions uh, and not bother scanning heat maps and scanning access bits on regions where we know it's completely pointless. So, uh, I mean, we do have, for example, I think it's M advice sequential or something like that, but I think history told us that people used it for some time and then we stopped using it in the kernel and then it's a knob. <laughs> so, uh, I, I guess I tend to agree that it might be worthwhile to look into, but in general, developers are lazy and programs change. And um, th that's why we have autonoma at all. Uh, my comment here would be regarding hot pages. Uh, you say here that hot pages are many excesses over a short period of time. But how often would it happen that you have excesses over a short period of time, then you migrate the page and then you realize, well, the page is no longer hot. Yeah, that, that's a big issue also. So sometimes, you know, you detect a hot page, you say, okay, this one is hot, I'm making it faster, and then it becomes cold right, right after that. Exactly. So um, what I would question is, like, how fast are we able, actually required to make a decision? And what, what I just, like, had in mind is, I think recently there was some kind of LOU list resorting based on daemon. And I mean, I, I think they do fairly slow stuff because we're talking about page reclaim. But somehow it has like the same concept. You have some list and you try to see what's most important, which is on front of the list. So I, I guess if you improve one, one mechanism, you could, might benefit from the other. And yeah, but I think the other review for odd pages is kind of a the sampling frequency is too too slow. So it's not. Yeah, I don't think it's a good. But you know that's that's a feeling more than anything, until somebody uh, can can prove on a large work set that okay this is actually proving to be good or not, uh, it's hard to uh, to draw a conclusion. Exactly, uh, but, but, uh, but just like looking at n most recently used addresses, I, I'm not sure if that really helps us to detect hot pages that will remain hot that are not just like access for yeah, and, and there is no way to detect that really. Uh, Mel Goldman has a comment that uh, the main limitation on PME, PMU based sampling were issues that A, constant overhead, B, inability to back off if pages are properly placed, C, consumption of a PMU that was only available for other users, and D, limited to hardware that has the right PMU event available. <clears throat> Just a quick co comment about the counters and the tweaking between global counter and per CPU. Just make sure you compare with this CPU ops which for things like Intel, they use the segment selector uh, register to offset from the CPU. So there may not be this extra uh, de -referent, pointer de reference in those situations. So you may not have to do that work. So I think, so that's the <laughs> odd page situation. So the cold page I wanted to point out also, Damon, um, I think like daemon is not really well adapted for cold pages detection. The access bit, like I was saying, the access bit is really good for cold pages, really. Like I think cold pages kind of solve, really. I don't think anybody else has anything beside access bit. Okay, so odd page, obviously we want hardware, uh, you know, many pitfall. Uh, it can be out for a short period of time and then become cold again. Uh, it can be, uh, you know, like what kind of heuristic we choose, uh, but we want hardware because the sampling frequency is too high. Um, and there is the issue of how many counter do we want? You know, if we have 4,000, do we want 8,000? Like, you know, how many is good enough? Um, hard to know. And obviously, very silicon cost with that. Um, 
I don't know if we want to to talk more about about pages. Maybe just like a minute or two on on page migration. So on page migration, we have a couple of kernel API. Uh, kind of my question is like, do we want more asynchronous API? Do we want something like uh, IOU ring for memory? Like page migration can also be used for memory or claim and all stuff like that. Um, you know, I just like I'm throwing idea to see what what you know people how people feels about these kind of things, um, and it kind of goes any end actually with kind of a last one is like, do we want to do it in kernel or do we want to do it in user space? Uh, the experience we have here at, at Google is more that uh, user uh, use space is um, a better place to to um, implement policy and change policy uh, because we see a variety of application and we see one policy works well for a group of application another policy going to work well for another group of application and it's much easier if we can have like you know like kind of a c group uh, id or like uh, like that and have different policy for different group of application and it's really um, uh, usually easier to also try different policy inside user space than it is to uh, embed the kernel um, so you know um, I'm not saying we should disable all the kernel, um, you know, like Autonoma or stuff like that. Um, but usually it's kind of thing we do, we disable them and we're trying to do stuff inside user space. Um, but I still value, you know, like the LRU list, the multi-generation, all you just think the talk after that. Um, you know, I still believe some of the kernel mechanism do make sense and they need to be augmented with memory tiering. So I don't know how people feel about that, this split between user space versus kernel space. I guess I'm like asking questions so that like, <laughs> trying to gather consensus here. Um, what, what, user space, Les? <laughs> uh, so, so what, one one of the ways we've talked we, we we've talked about sometimes on using this kind of thing is that maybe that you 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 offer this as your as your data center service that um, if if you have a bronze tier VM then always, then everything gets put in in sort of slow memory and the gold level VM always gets put into the hot zone and, and you differentiate that way and this is how you use it. It's, it's it's not going to be a solution for everything but it's one way to use this kind of memory. Yeah, it's an, it's a very easy way. That's true. So if you have multiple tier of memory, you can sell the lower tier at the lower price, um, but. You know, like I say, there is also the, the thing is that even for high tier application, uh, they have a large chunk. We see many applications with large chunk of memory that is cool and just a waste of memory, really. Um, and and as, as efficiently as possible. Is it? I, th I think actually our, our, our uh, goal is, is to extract the maximum amount of money from the people who are renting our house. <laughs> 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 Well, so, so, and as for your question here, I mean, I, I think we can all agree that we're not going to have one answer to these things. Like, it obviously can't just be in the kernel, right? Um, we're going to have people that will be fine with the kernel solution because they want to write dumb applications that don't know anything. We're also going to have the really smart folks who know how to do exactly what they want, set their whole app up, and just say, kernel, hands off. You don't know what you're doing. So, I mean, both will exist and maybe even on the same machines. So. Yeah, and I, uh, you know, like I say, I think I don't want them to step on over each other too, basically. So you want to make sure that, you know, they don't conflict um, and one on be what the user is doing, which is kind of a big issue. Um, so, but Barata has a comment uh, regarding page migration. If the platform, say via DMA engine, can accelerate page moves uh, between tiers, can we have migration APIs that can hand over the migration to its driver, DMA engine driver perhaps? Is there such a migration API already? So I think the DMA is not the big issue when it comes to page migration. It's more like on mapping the page, doing all of the answering metadata stuff. It's it's a bit more on like, that's what we're seeing so far. Yeah, there's some fancy memory moving accelerators. People like, hey, this will work for page migration. And yes, it will, but exactly. All the software overhead to get everything done before you can move it in the hardware is the big problem. The hardware doesn't help much. Yeah. And, and versus solutions, so I don't, yeah, what date are we actually? The 12, yeah. Okay, so I kind of talk. But like, versus our solution about page migration? Um, coming from multiple vendor, um, so, um, but yeah, so, so it's, right now the DMA is not the big issue. It's, it's worth noting that anytime you've got code that deals with pages and, this, and also the data within those pages, we lose a lot of performance by blowing away our caches and then looking at pages. We really want to vectorize the, all of those APIs, and if we do that, then it's much easier to make use of hardware offload. I'll say one more thing. There have been hardware designs as well that tried to do essentially memory migration in hardware, right? There's something called uh, two-level memory that Intel had that moved stuff between DRAM and the Optane, which is the memory stuff. It sounds like a really good idea, and it gets software out of the business of moving stuff, but it loses a bunch of capacity, and the hardware was just, it 
it didn't work very well for a lot of people. It was great for some people, but not everybody loved it. So we're, we're, into, the, we're into lunch break. You don't have to stop talking, <laughs> but we do have a coffee break right now, and the other micro conferences are letting out and are eating our snacks. So, <laughs> well, thank you for like the discussion. That's really what I wanted.